Yeah. You say something, Bill. You, you ought to hear what you want to hear. <laughs> chapter 7, talking about the things going on in the world, all these people are getting accomplished, getting God tipped, according to Psalm chapter 2. Uh, Psalm chapter 2 says, why do the heathen rage and the people imagine a vain thing? Kings of the earth set themselves and the rulers take counsel together against God and against his anointed saying, let us break their bands asunder, cast away their cords. He that sitteth in the heavens shall laugh. That's all they're getting done, Bill. They ain't making him sweat. I can promise you that. Yeah, yeah. They're getting him tickled. Amen. But I, it's, it's, it's getting harder and harder to live in this world. You know, you wake up and your heart's pure. Your heart is, uh, you have no ill intentions in your heart. Want to see people saved and to come to the knowledge of the truth, and you've come, I've come to realize that that people in this world, that, you know, the Bible talks about them who hate themselves. Yeah. Paul talks about those who oppose themselves. Talks about those who despise their own soul. Mm -hmm. It is hard caring for people more than they care for themselves. Sure. You share the gospel with people. Forty-five minutes the other day, I, I pulled up. To do a job, had a young boy with me, 23 years old. I pulled up in the parking lot to our next job, and I shut the truck off, and I said, what are you going to do? He said, what are you talking about? I said, the world's getting crazy. I said, what are you going to do? He said, there's nothing I can do to fix it. I said, I ain't talking about fixing the world. I said, what are you going to do about yourself? He said, what can I do? I told him the whole thing, John. I showed him what was going on in the world. Satan's plot to possess heaven and earth, God's plan to reconcile it by Jesus Christ. I said, what side are you going to get on? Yeah. You going to be a part of this plot to try to possess heaven and earth away from God and his son? Or are you going to be reconciled back to your creator through the blood of Jesus Christ? Yeah. The problem with people today, though, is we've removed God's law and the word of God from so many aspects of society. People don't understand their need of the cross because they don't even understand that they're sinners anymore. That's right. Preacher, They've been told that homosexuality is fine. They've been told that murder is fine. They've been told all this stuff is okay. And so they do not understand the condition they're in. Therefore, the law was our schoolmaster to bring us to Christ. They don't understand their need of Christ because the schoolmaster hasn't shown them their human condition. Yeah. Amen. Romans chapter 7, read verses 1 through 6 here. We've been looking at this for about two weeks. Paul says, Know ye not, brethren, for I speak to them that know the law. How that the law hath dominion over a man as long as he liveth. For the woman which hath a husband is bound by the law to her husband so long as he liveth. But if the husband be dead, she is loosed from the law of her husband. So then if while her husband liveth, she be married to another man, she shall be called an adulteress. But if her husband be dead, she is free from that law so that she is no adulteress though she be married to another man. Now verse 4 begins the good news. Wherefore, my brethren, ye also are become dead to the law by the body of Christ, Amen. that ye should be married to another, even to him who is raised from the dead, that we should bring forth fruit unto God. For when we were in the flesh, the motions of sin, which were by the law, did work in our members to bring forth fruit unto death. But now, we are delivered from the law, that being dead wherein we were held, that we should serve in newness of spirit and not in the oldness of the letter. So tonight I want to look at this, the newness of spirit versus the oldness of the letter. See, over the last two weeks we've been looking at what the Bible calls functional death in the believer. What Paul's talking about, Romans chapter 7 and 8, functional death in the believer. Look there in Romans 7, 9. I don't know how, how, how people miss this reading through these chapters. Look, look at the end of verse 9, Romans 7. And I died. You see that? Yeah. 
Look at the end of verse number 10. I found to be unto death. Look at the end of verse 11. Slew me. At the end of verse 13. Working death. What's sad about it is people think this is the Christian experience. Most Christians in this world today think Romans 7 is what they are, they are to expect being in Christ. Paul, listen, this is what, fun, this is what we, we, remember when we were talking about functional death. Death functioning in the life of the believer. Look at what he says in verse 13. The middle of the verse. But sin that it might appear sin, working what? Death in me? Is that the Christian life? The working of death in you? Absolutely not. Come down to verse 24. The end of verse 24. The body of this what? Death. What death? Being under the law but unable to perform it. Look at chapter 8, verse number 6. For to be carnally minded is death. Verse 13. If you live after the flesh, ye shall die. And so when I said, well, a couple of weeks ago, when I said, talk, started talking about functional death, I'm not making anything up. That death is a main subject of Romans chapter 7 and 8. Death working in somebody. Paul said, sin revived, I died. The commandments slew me. It's death working in me. Who shall deliver me from the body of this death? He's talking about death functioning in somebody. But in Romans chapter 8, he starts talking about life functioning. Look at Romans 8 too. For the law of the spirit of what? Life. The end of verse number 6. To be spiritually minded is life. If you live after the flesh, ye shall die. But if you through the spirit be mortify the deeds of the body, ye shall live. Now people struggle with these passages. Specifically a couple in Romans chapter 8. About death. They're like, what does that mean to be carnally minded as death? You know, people, people, think, people think that that means that, that somebody that's carnally minded is going to hell. For when, Paul, when Paul says, if you live after the flesh, ye shall die, there are preachers all over America that will use a verse like that to say, if you live after the flesh, you lose your salvation. You're going to die. Ye shall die, Paul says. And the reason people struggle with these passages is quite simply, they don't truly understand the meaning of death. Well, God told Adam, the day you eat thereof, you shall surely die. You believe he did? You believe God lied? Look, when Paul wrote Romans 7 9, he says, When the commandment came, sin revived, and I died. Therefore, death doesn't just mean them putting you in a casket and burying you in the ground. Amen. It evidently has more meanings than just, you know, leaving the body and the body dying. And the way Paul's using it in Romans chapter 8, the, the, the reason people struggle with a passage like this is they come to a passage like this, just like we talked Sunday morning, assuming they know what death is, and then they try to read the passage in light of their understanding of death. There you go. Amen. We talked about this in 1 Corinthians 15, 29. Where Paul said over there, we talked about it Sunday morning, what shall they do that are baptized for the dead? If the dead rise not, why are they then baptized for the dead? There's nothing hard about the verse. We can read it. We understand it. The difficulty in the passage is what is it to be baptized for the dead? That's what plagues people. And the reason people can't understand the verse is because to them, baptism is immersion in water and death. The dead are people buried in the ground. So in their mind, those are people being baptized in water for people that are buried in the ground. That's the only thing they can think of. The reality is baptism has, there's multiple baptisms in the Bible. And in the context of 1 Corinthians 15, the dead are all men in Adam. In Adam all die. And so every man born into this world in Adam, until he gets in Christ, he's dead. Amen. Paul said, you have he quickened who were dead in trespasses and sins. And so, and so we can't come to a passage like Romans chapter 8 assuming that we know what death is. The truest meaning of the word, of the word death 
It's kind of like darkness. I was telling Chanel this the other day. You know, darkness is nothing. Darkness is simply the absence of light. You can't add more darkness. You can get to absolute darkness, which means absolute, total absence of light. But you can't add more darkness to that. You can keep adding light. There's no such thing as cold. Did you know that? Cold is the absence of heat. You get down to absolute zero, you can't make anything colder. Because all cold is is the absence of heat. Death is the same thing. Death is absence of life. That's all it is. You, you, can, you, you can be breathing down here in this world and this body can be animated. But when the Bible talks about death, death is being alienated from the life of God. Yeah. And, and, so, and so the truest meaning of death is simply the absence of life. Look at Romans 8, 2 there. For the law of the spirit of what? Life in Christ Jesus hath made me free from the law of sin and death. Amen. Death cannot, listen, life, life destroys death. Death is the absence of life. So when you got life, you were no longer in death. Amen. Paul said, I am crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live, yet not I, but who? Christ liveth in me. And so the life we now have, we received from Jesus Christ. But when, talk, when Paul talks about functional death then, he's talking about people who function apart from the life of Jesus Christ. Right. They're operating in something that brings them into death instead of into life. Mm -hmm. And we're going, to, we're going to see where this comes from. You have the spirit and you have the flesh. If you live after what? The flesh... Ye shall die. If you through the Spirit mortify the deeds of the body, ye shall live, is what Paul says. And so this stuff's important as we're going to see. And so death in a believer is simply not functioning in the life of Christ. It comes from a carnal mind walking after the flesh. Now we have to understand that a carnal mind, I say this all the time on people, you know, you take the average, you take the average legalistic Christian. They, to them, a carnal mind is the people out here that don't go to church, that do drugs, they're tattooed up and everything else. What I want you to understand, I think you people do understand this, is some of the most carnal people sit in church buildings like this all the time. They're carnal. We're going to see what the contents of a carnal mind is tonight. But then you have those that are spiritual. Paul says the carnal mind, people who are carnally minded, walking after the flesh, or dead, and people who are spiritually minded, walking after the Spirit, they are the ones who are alive and living. And so, and, and listen, what I'm about to lay out here tonight, and I, I'm not going to try not to keep y'all long, but what I'm trying to, what, what I'm laying out here tonight, you come to the Apostle Paul. We, we agree that the Apostle Paul is an important man in history, don't we? I mean, people, you, you know, I don't care. I don't care what doctors or theologians say about the issue. None of them wrote any books of the Bible. Yeah, there you go. Okay, I know what the Bible says about this man. He was a chosen vessel of Jesus Christ. You come to his epistles, and the first one is Romans. What man you are reading is in the first eight chapters of Romans. Would y'all agree with me that that is foundational Christianity? Right here. Paul is laying out the very basics and foundation of what God gave him for us. He's already shown you how to be justified. And in, in beginning at the end of Romans chapter 5, down to the end of Romans chapter 8, he is talking about how you are now to function in your new identity in Jesus Christ. Now here's what's sad about it. Here's what's sad about it. Foundational Christianity, right? And yet these are some of the most unknown truths in the world today. Isn't that something? Jesus Christ died to give life to us and yet most people are still functioning in death instead of life. 
And, 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 and listen, if you folks would be honest with yourselves like I have, and, and I'm not saying that you haven't, but I, you know, there come a point in my life I had to read what the Bible was saying. What Paul says in Romans 7, newness of spirit, not in the oldness of the letter. I had to read what he said in 2 Corinthians, that God hath made us able ministers of the New Testament, not of the letter, for the letter killeth, but the spirit giveth life. I had to come to a point in my life where I look back at my Christian experience from a young man up and I had to acknowledge to myself that no matter how much I loved them, no matter how, no matter how good they were, and no matter how much I did learn from them, the majority of ministers I sat under in my life was ministering the letter to me and killing me spiritually. Mm -hmm. yeah. I had to come to that conclusion. The, the majority of preachers in this world today do not know how to minister life and the spirit to the body of Christ. All they can do is man, minister the letter. And this is why we have such a dysfunctional, uh, a dysfunctional form of Christianity in America today. Amen? Amen. Ministration of, of, of the letter. Now last week we looked at Romans chapter 6. Flip back real quick. Romans chapter 6. <clears throat> Romans chapter 6 is nothing more than Paul laying out our identification. That's what baptism is. Know you not that so many of us as were baptized into Jesus Christ were baptized into his death. When the moment, the moment that I heard and trusted the gospel, the Spirit of God completely immersed me in Jesus Christ. Amen. Yeah. You know you can't get in Christ with water. You get in Christ by one spirit. But that spirit completely immersed me in him, Bill. I'm now 100% share in the identification of Jesus Christ. Amen. He come down here and was completely identified with my sin. Took, the, took my sin to the cross. Completely identified himself with me. And in my, my condition and my death, and then rose from the dead so that I could be completely identified with his life and his position in heaven and earth. Amen. Paul says, do you not know as many of you as were baptized into Jesus Christ were baptized into his death? Right. I'm completely identified with him. Knowing this, that our old man is crucified with him. Romans 6, 8, now if we be dead with Christ, that's our identification. If we've been planted together in what? The likeness of His death, we shall be also in the likeness of His resurrection. That's my identification. And Paul lays out this identification, and then as a result of this new identification we have, we now have a new relationship to sin and righteousness. Nobody asks you how you feel about the matter. I'm telling you what Paul is saying. He's not, he's not talking about your experience. He's saying in Adam, this is who you were. In Christ, this is who you are. Amen. Amen. And then he's telling you how to walk and live in light of that new identity. Look at what he, look at what he says down in Romans 6.22. Here's our new relationship. But now, being made free from sin Amen. and become servants to God. Amen? We're not bondage, Bill. Sin, we, we, we don't have to let sin rule us any longer. Amen. Look at what he said in Romans 6, 12. Let not sin therefore what? Reign. We make an excuse, don't we? I've heard, I've heard preachers say it all the time. You know, we're all going to sin. Yes. I mean, I'm not, I'm not up here telling you that, that any of us are perfect or anything. What I'm telling you is that in Jesus Christ, you're free from sin. Amen. And there's no point putting your head down anymore and walking around saying, oh, wretched man that I am. That, it's, it's like I said, that is a false humility. It sounds good. And I was telling little Paul on the way home, the way you glorify God's grace is not by humbling yourself and talking about how horrible you are. The way you glorify God's grace is to tell people who he's made you in Jesus Amen. Christ. Amen. Ain't no point talking about who you used to be. Yeah, yeah. Paul didn't harp on that stuff. He said, before time I was a blasphemer. Before time. 
Remember what he said in Ephesians? The new identity. Remember in time past, you were strangers and aliens? He says, but now, Amen. now you are no more strangers and foreigners, but fellow citizens of the household of God. You glorify God's grace. Listen, we don't, we don't brag about ourselves. We glory in Him. Amen. But we don't, we don't magnify the grace of God by sitting down here and just saying a whole bunch of wretched sinners that we are. We're joint heirs with Jesus Christ, Bill. Yeah. Forgiven all trespasses. Seated in heavenly places. Blessed with all spiritual blessings. Joint heirs with Him. That's what, I mean, that's what magnifies God. Paul said to the praise of the glory of His grace wherein He hath made us accepted in the beloved. Giving thanks unto the Father which hath made us meet to be partakers of the inheritance of the saints in life. I mean, that's our identification in Christ. And so, and so we have to learn who, who we are. We are free from sin. We are servants of righteousness. And so when you come into chapter 7, Paul's laid out your identity in Christ and your new relationship to sin and righteousness, and then in chapter 7 he comes over, and he's now going to show you how we serve righteousness. Do we do it by the law, the letter? Absolutely not. Why? Because you're dead. And Paul's going to show you the law only has dominion over, uh, only has dominion for as long as a man lives. Well, if you're dead, then the law has no more dominion over you. And so then how do we serve righteousness? In newness of spirit. We're going to see that as we come down through these verses. And so, and so Romans 7 and 8, Paul's going to show you how to function in Jesus Christ, how to serve God and bring forth fruit unto God. Amen? And these two chapters alone, Romans 7 and 8, these two chapters alone separate the carnal from the spiritual. You don't, listen, you don't, you can't tell a spiritual and a carnal person apart by the clothing. I can take you in Methodist churches, Pentecostal churches, Church of God churches, Baptist churches, where they're all dressed the same, but none of their minds are the same. Yeah, there you go. So you have, what are you doing judging spirituality and carnality by the flesh? Yeah. Carnal and spiritual is a state of mind. Okay? And, and it, it basically deals, and it, it's important that you understand this, because the only way you're going to understand what the purpose of the letter was, what was the point of the letter of the law? It was to reveal who I was. God's law was given to reveal sin and death working in you. It's the law of the Spirit that reveals who Christ is. And if we're going to walk in our identification in Christ, it comes from the law of the Spirit, not the law of the letter. The letter is for the flesh. The law of the Spirit is for the inner man and the spiritual man. And we're going to see, we're, we're going to see all this as we come down through here. But basically, when you come into Romans 7 and 8, you have to understand this. Those functioning in Romans 7 are functioning in death. You don't believe it? Read what Paul says. How many times he got to use the word death? Look what he said. I love Romans 7, 9. For I was alive without the law once. But when the commandment came, sin revived, and I died. Yeah. Amen. Romans 7 is functioning, is death functioning in the believer. Those functioning in Romans chapter 8 have life functioning in them. So what Romans 7 and 8 is, Paul tells us in Romans 7, 6, that we serve in newness, newness of spirit, and not in the oldness of the letter. And then he goes on a, on a I ain't going to say a rant, but from Romans 7, 7, uh, down to Romans 8, 17, Paul is contrasting the effects of these two things. If you function, if you go under the letter and try to serve under the letter, the result is going to be death. If you serve in this newness of spirit, the result is going to be life. Okay? That's, that stuff's important to understand, and it's also important. That it, and listen, man, 
you read these two chapters, it becomes easy to diagnose your spiritual state and your, your, your spiritual well-being. God does not write these things to destroy you. God writes these things to build you up. The Bible is the greatest book of psychology ever written, Bill. It can diagnose the mind of man like it's nothing. I mean, it's a discerner of the intents and thoughts of the heart is what the Bible says. And so this book diagnoses us. For example, look at Romans 7, 23. But I see another law in my members warring against the law of my what? Mind. Well, look at Romans 8, 8, 6 for contrast. To be carnally minded is death, but to be spiritually minded is what? Life and what? Peace. So the spiritual mind is not, a, is not a warring mind. It's a mind of peace. Back in Romans 7, under the letter, there was war being in, there was war in Paul. His flesh was warring against his mind. But in Romans 8, 6, there's life and peace. And so what's your state of mind? Are you in a state of conflict and warfare? That warfare, I want you to notice Romans 7, 23 again. I see another law in my members warring against the law of my mind and bringing me into captivity to the law of sin. Well, that's not supposed to be who you are in Christ. Amen. Paul said in Romans 8, 2, that the law of the spirit of life hath made me free from the law of sin and death. And then he said to be spiritually minded is life and peace. So those who are serving in newness of spirit, what are they? Free from the law of sin and death and uh, enjoying a state of life and peace. Those under the letter and serving in the letter are in a constant state of conflict and warfare with sin in their body and are constantly being brought into captivity. That's the difference between a carnal and a spiritual person. That's the difference between them walking after the flesh and those walking after the spirit. This is the difference between true spirituality and false spirituality. I hope that makes sense to you. And so as, as we move into these two chapters where Paul's contrasting these two things, the letter and the spirit, we cannot forget as we come into these things the things pertaining to our identity because it's our identification that lays at the root of all this. Okay, and so first off, you have to know, Romans 8, 10. We'll read some verses here. As far as our identity goes, or identification, you have to understand that you've got two of them. You see this, Paul always talks about this, oldness and newness. The old man and the new man, right? Yeah. The Old Testament and the New Testament. The Old Testament killed, the New Testament gives life. <laughs> right? The old man and the new man, the oldness and newness. Paul always contrasts these things. And so you have to understand that you have two identities. Look in Romans 8.10. And if Christ be in you, the body is what? Because of sin, the spirit is what? Life because of righteousness. So there's, there's two parts. There's two of you. There's, there's a part of you that's dead and a part of you alive. There's a part of you that's dead because of sin. Now what, what does dead mean again? Remember what it meant? Absence of life. There is no life in the flesh. It's dead because of sin. The life, the spirit is life because of righteousness. Therefore, if you want life to animate through the body and make this body instruments of righteousness, it can only come through the spirit, not anything else. Life has to come from the Spirit. The first Adam was made a living soul. The last Adam was made a quickening spirit. And so all this, when Paul says this, you, that's important stuff. Newness of Spirit. Amen. It's important. Romans 8, 23. Two identities. There's two of you. you gotta, you got to learn which one's real. Amen. Paul says, Romans 8, 23, not only they, talking about the creation, they're not the only thing groaning in travail, not only they, but ourselves also, which have the first fruits of the Spirit, even we ourselves, groan within what? 
So there's a you growing within you. So there's two of you. Yeah. Right? Ourselves grown within ourselves. And so there's a part. What, what does Paul mean by that? There's a part of you that's living and being renewed day by day. And there's a part of you dying. And the part of you living that's now received the first fruits of the Spirit, that part of you is now groaning within this, waiting for the adoption to wit the redemption of the body. Amen. And so you have a fleshly identity, you have a spiritual identity. The body's dead, the spirit is life. The spirit, the first fruits of the spirit, those of us who have it, are now groaning within this body. 2 Corinthians 4, 16, you ain't got to flip there, you know the verse. Paul said, though our outward man perish, yet our inward man is renewed day by day. There's two of you. There's a part of you dying and a part of you living. You look in Galatians 5, 17, you don't have to flip there, I'll read it. The flesh lusteth against the spirit, and the spirit against the flesh. These are contrary one to the other, so that you cannot do the things you would. And so there's the flesh, there's the spirit. You have two identities. You are something in the flesh and you are something in the spirit. Those who walk after the flesh are living in death. Those who walk after the spirit are living in life. We're not talking about saved and lost people. We're talking about carnal and spiritual believers. Carnal believers walk after the flesh. Spiritual believers walk after the spirit. One of them is functioning in death. The other one is functioning in life. Okay, so now, the second thing you have to understand is who you are in the flesh is crucified, dead, and buried. Colossians 2.11. You know the verse. We all know the verse. But the full, the, the full truth of this verse is something that I, I've come to realize recently. I've known the verse. But when Paul says in Colossians 2, 11, that in Christ ye are circumcised with a circumcision made without hands, in putting off the body of the sins of the flesh by the circumcision of Christ. Remember, your two, remember we just said you had two identities, one in the flesh, one in the spirit. Well, who you are in the flesh has been put off by the circumcision of Christ. Amen. You are in no way, shape, or form ever going to be connected with the identity of that old man ever again. He's crucified, John. Paul said, Paul said what the law could not do and that it was weak for the flesh. God sending his son in the likeness of sinful flesh and for sin. You see how Christ was identified with you? I love that verse in Hebrews. I don't care if it comes from Hebrews or not where it says, it says he's not ashamed to call them brethren. Amen? Partook in flesh and blood, Bill. He identified himself with us. He came in the likeness of sinful flesh and for sin and condemned sin in the flesh. The sin that's in my flesh has already been condemned in Jesus Christ. And now I'm circumcised from that old man and I'm forever identified with him. Glory to God. Yeah, the longer I'm at it, the more I'm persuaded, Bill, that life or death, principalities, powers, they can't do nothing about it. My identity is in the Lord Jesus Christ, who I am in this flesh, this old thing up here perishing and dying. Though it's perishing, it's not who I am anymore. I'm no longer even connected to this thing. Paul said in Romans 8 and 9, when we, he, say, he says, they that are in the flesh cannot please God, but ye, brethren, are not in the flesh, but in the Spirit. Amen. This is not my identity anymore. And so it's absolutely pointless for me to walk according to this. Yeah. Paul said, if you be dead from the rudiments of the world, why is though living in the world are you subject to ordinances? You know what? People subject themselves to the elements of the world. They don't understand who they are in Christ. Paul said, our conversation is in heaven. We don't talk about the earth. We don't talk about earthly and carnal things. We talk about spiritual things. Paul said, the things we speak is taught to us by the Holy Ghost. 
And the natural man does not receive them because they are spiritually discerned. Yeah. Amen. The moment we were baptized into Jesus Christ by one spirit, we received a brand new spiritual identity in Jesus Christ. 2 Corinthians chapter 5. I'm going to be winding down. 2 Corinthians chapter 5. I always just like to hear John Chubb. <laughs> Second Corinthians chapter 5. I'm brand new, man. Amen. Brand new, Bill. Yeah, boy. I'm not even a, uh, you know, don't, don't take me wrong. I mean, we, we're all sinners saved by the grace of God. But the moment I got to Christ, I was no, I was no longer a sinner. And I know that baffles people. We're not talking about who I am by my works. We're talking about who God the Father has wonderfully created me to be in Jesus Christ. And to say anything contrary is to deny what Jesus accomplished through yeah, his death, burial, and resurrection. Yeah. Paul said, Paul said, for by the disobedience of one, many were made sinners. Even so, by the obedience of one, were many made righteous. That's who we are now. Amen. In Adam all die, even so in Christ shall all be made alive. Amen, amen, amen. And so when I got in Christ, I become a brand new man. Amen. Paul said in Ephesians 2, to making himself of twain one new man. So making peace. Look at 2 Corinthians 5, 14. For the love of Christ constraineth us, because we thus judge that if one died for all, then we're all dead. And that he died for all, that they which live should not henceforth live unto themselves, but unto him which died for them, and what? Rose again. Where's he at, Bill? He's seated in heaven. And so if he died for me, it was for the purpose of giving me life, and now that I have life, it's for the purpose that I should no longer live unto myself, but unto him that died and rose. And if I'm living to him, who's now seated at the right hand of God, then you can't judge me by the flesh. Amen. Amen. Look at what he says. Wherefore, in light of this fact that we're now living unto him that died and rose again, henceforth know we no man after the what? Flesh. You see, you see, when I get up here and I talk about identification. This is not some some fly. By. This is this is a this is a doctrine contained in Romans through Philemon at, over and over and over again. Paul's talking about our identity in Christ in Second Corinthians chapter five. Henceforth know we no man after the flesh. You don't know me after the flesh anymore. You don't know me as Paul Lucas. Paul Lucas was a wretch, Bill. Amen. Yeah. He was. Just an old dead sinner. But who God made me in Christ is something brand new. Amen. Henceforth know we no man after the flesh, yea, though we have known Christ after the flesh, yet now henceforth know we him no more. Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things are become what? There's that old new again. Who we were in Adam, man, he's gone. You're no longer in any way, shape, or form connected to that, to that identity anymore. That man's dead. This stuff is important. When we come into Romans 7, you're going to have to understand what this is. The oldness of the letter is about your identity in the flesh. Paul said, I have not known sin but by the law. All the law is going to do is reveal just how vile and wretched Bill Keener and Paul Lucas is in the flesh. That's all it will do. It's never going to give me life. It's never, going to, it's never going to enrich me with the life of Christ and cause me to come alive unto Him. All it's going to do is put me in bondage to sin, mm -hmm. condemn me, and kill me. Mm -hmm. That's all it can do. It's weak. The law is weak to the flesh. And so this gets, this, this gets to the very contents. I'm going to close with this statement. And I, I'm going to pick up, we're, man, Romans 7 and 8 are some great chapters once you understand them. Bill, I've studied them for, I've studied them, man. I, I've stared at Romans 6, 7, and 8 
for hours on end. I, I, I would read about seven or eight verses, get down through there, realize I didn't understand any of it, go back and read it again. And I've, I've studied and studied and studied. And when what, what, what God has shown me in these chapters has worked miracles in, in my service and in my inner man. Amen. That's what I was always worried about. Bill, I can put on a show for you people all day long. I can put on my suit and tie, shake hands with the brother, you know, give him a holy kiss, you know. I can, I can put on a show, I can put on a fleshly show all day long. When I get in bed tonight, that show ain't going to help who I am. What won't help my thoughts? You tell people they're not under the law, they say, well, do you think it's okay to murder? Because we're not under the law? You know what I say to stupid stuff like that? You know what I say to it? If, only, if the only thing keeping you from killing people is what's written on some stone, you got some serious heart issues that need resolved. True righteousness does not come from obeying words. True righteousness is who you are in your inner man. And when you, when Jesus Christ fills you, Bill, you don't need the law. Amen. The law was not made for a righteous man. Do you got his righteousness or not? And so if the law, the law wasn't made for a righteous man, but for the godless and lawless and disobedient. And so what we're talking about, this carnality versus spirituality, this identification, what we're talking about are spiritual identity in Christ. Spiritual identity. Not fleshly identity. This gets to the very contents of what the carnal and spiritual mind are. The carnal mind, Paul said, minds the things of the flesh. They, they that are after the spirit do mind the things of the spirit. The spiritual mind is a mind who's focused on the unseen spiritual things that God has revealed by faith in Jesus Christ. The carnal mind is focused on the things he can see and hear and feel and touch and taste. Yeah. You understand? And, and a carnal mind is constantly identifying itself outside of Christ. Did you know that? Sure. Amen. They never talk about who they are in Christ. They always want to put a name on them and identify themselves. The, foot, the carnal mind identifies itself according to the flesh. Republican, Democrat, white, black, black uh, Baptist, Methodist, American. The spiritual mind realizes who they are in Christ and says, I'm above all of it. Are you seated in Him? Far above all principality and power. Amen. Has God made foolish the wisdom of this world? Yes, sir. Amen, amen, amen. When I realize who God made me in Christ, I'm so far above the things of this world, I ain't going to waste my time with them. Now, as long as I'm here, as long as I have a voice and a vote, I'm going to vote. And I'm going to vote for the one who I think is going to hold back evil the longest. I'm not putting my trust in any man in Washington to fix what's going on in the world. Only Jesus Christ can do that. There you go. But when God instituted government, it was, being, it was to be a terror to evil. Not to give you welfare, not to give you food stamps, and not to give you a better life. The government was put here by God to be a terror to evil. And if I'm going to cast my vote, it's going to be the one who takes the best stand against evil in this world. Amen. That's the only thing that I cast my vote upon. But outside of that, we're so far above the congressmen and senators of this world and the kings of this world, Bill, it's not even funny. You could, you could, you could give them the strongest, you could give them the strongest telescope NASA's got, and they couldn't find those in Christ if they had to. Amen. We're so far above them. That's right. You say, and you say, how do you know that? Because I know who God's made me in Christ. I know my spiritual identity. I'm not talking about who I am in the flesh. Mm -hmm. I'm talking about who I am in Christ. Amen? And so when you understand that, look at Romans 7 and 1. I'm going to read that verse. Put my notes there. This, this kind of prepared you for what we're going to look at next week. 
Romans 7, 1 through 6 is one part where Paul's basically just showing how we now serve and then verses from verse 7 over in the chapter 8, verse 7, 10, 10 is, 17 is him expounding upon these, these two programs, the letter and the spirit. But look at, look at I'm sorry, Romans 7, 2. You see that phrase there, the woman which hath a husband? You see that? Romans 7, 2. Well, that woman... As long as her husband lives, the law binds that woman to her husband. She can only, she's only loose from that husband through death. Now listen, Paul wasn't in the midst of writing. This is this how, this how Baptists are, man. I'm telling you, they are. They miss the great truths of Romans 5, 6, and 7, and all they get out of Romans 7 is the is, is, the, is the two living husbands. You know, that's all they get out of it. Paul's not teaching you about your wonderful identification in Christ and being dead to sin and servants of righteousness and how you now serve God and be like, oh, by the way, let me give you three verses on marriage and divorce. There's a reason Paul brings this up. And in verse 4, he tells you why. Wherefore, my brethren, you also are become what? Dead to the law, by the body of Christ that ye should be what? Married. Married to another. You're the husband and the wife in the, in the spiritual application. Remember I told you you had two identities. An inner and an outer man. One of them's dead. One of them's alive. The part of you that is now dead is the husband. But his, the law of that husband was sin. And while you were under the law, that law bound you to the law of that husband as long as he lived. Therefore, under the law, man was under the dominion of sin and death. But the moment Jesus Christ hung on that cross and bled and died for us, we become dead by the body of Christ so that our spirit could be married to another man. And that man is Jesus Christ who is now raised from the dead. And so, I do not serve now in this. This is that old husband. Mm -hmm. He's dead. And so my union to Jesus Christ is how? In the spirit. Therefore, if I'm going to serve and bring forth fruit unto God, it has to be in the newness of spirit and not in the oldness of the letter. And we'll, pick up, we'll pick up with this next week. I hope this stuff, listen, I know this is deep stuff, but really it's basic Christianity. You know, I mean, it's just, uh, it's just sad. It's sad that I sat in church all these years. I'm not hard on those men. I'm really not. I love those guys. Loved every one of them. Tom Mylon, Donnie Farmer, you know, Mage Jackson. <laughs> I love those guys. I love them. They were great preachers. But you take something like this, that them men can take the law and cut you up one end down the other with it. They could make you feel about that big when you got out. Right. But I listened to them men for years and years and years. Not one of them ever taught me who I was in Jesus Christ. That's right. Not one of them ever taught me how to serve God. They told me what a failure I was. And it's like, I was like Paul. I want to do good, but how to do it I can't find. And Paul gives us the answer in Romans 7 and 8. And for whatever reasons, Christians don't want to hear it and preachers don't want to preach it. He tells you how to live. You live unto God by one spirit. And you function in life through Jesus Christ functioning in you by one spirit of God. Amen. 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 All right, let's pray. Father, we do thank